So Ian, do you want to do the introduction today? Oh, sure. Um, all right, so we've got Miriam talking today uh, from Emory University, and she will be speaking about elliptic curves and moonshine. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak here, and thank you for everybody for showing up. Um, the title of my talk is Elliptic Curves and Moonshine, and the main idea of this talk is the following. Um, see if I can actually move my, yep. The main idea is, can moonshine help answer number threaded questions? Um, so you might wonder what kinds of number threaded questions do I care about? And you might wonder, um, what is moonshine if you don't know? Sorry, I am trying to figure out my, here, this makes more sense. Okay, you might wonder, so you might have two questions. What is moonshine and what kinds of number theory questions do I care about? And I'm gonna start by answering the second one. I'm gonna tell you about a number theory question that I care about. So I'm gonna start with an elliptic curve defined over Q, and I'm gonna let EQ denote the set of two rational points of um, P. Right, so um, if you know anything about elliptic curves, EQ actually forms a group, um, and uh, Mordell proved in 1920s that it actually forms a finitely generated abelian group. Now, finitely generated abelian groups work in the following way. There's a, there's a, a finite part, EQ torsion, and there's an infinite part, uh, Z to the R, where R is some non-negative um, number. Um, computing the rank R of the general elliptic curve is considered a hard problem in number theory. And if this is the first time that you're, um, you're hearing about this problem, here's something to hold on to. The version Swinnerton dyer conjecture says that the rank of an elliptic curve order equals the order of vanishing of its all function at s equals one. Um, again, th if this is the first time you're hearing about this problem, then uh, notice that this is a conjecture. So it should indicate that this is a hard problem to solve. Um, and uh, we, we, we know this conjecture in in um, a few cases. In particular, it is known that if the L function is not zero, so if the order of vanishing is zero, right? So if something doesn't vanish, then its order of vanishing is zero, then the rank of the elliptic curve is also zero. Um, if you're taking any kinds of notes in this talk, then this is the one fact I would like you to take a note of, right? So at the end of, towards the end of this talk, I am going to refer back to this and uh, it would be helpful to remember this with that. Okay, um, so that's a general problem that's considered to be hard. Let's think about a more specific problem that we might be able to say something about. So let's consider this particular elliptic curve over Q. Y squared equals X cubed plus 864 X minus 432. Um, and let's look at for D, a negative fundamental discriminant, let's look at ED the quadratic twist of Q of E. Um, I basically just inserted D squared and D cubed in there, but what that has done is it has given me a new elliptic curve, which is e equal to my original one over C, but not over Q. So now as I vary D, I get a different elliptic curve for each value of D. Um, and I might wonder, um, how does the rank of ED vary as I vary D? So once you run into a problem like this, you might want to um, collect some data, right? The, the first step might be to collect some data and I'm gonna do that. So I'm going to restrict to this technical condition that D doesn't, that, that D not be a square modulo 19. And then I have this table in front of you. So for D uh, negative four, I have the rank of ED is zero, for D negative seven, the rank of ED is zero, so on and so forth. This is some data. So I have to introduce you to one other object. Uh, let F of tau be the unique weekly homomorphic modular form of weight three half level four um, that lies in the Conan's plus space, such that F of Q is Q to the minus five plus order of Q. It's, um, so the Conan plus space really means that um, the coefficients of q to the n are zero unless n is zero or three mod four. 
So this really is cute, cute, right? Um, and I'm going to let C of D denote the coefficient of Q to the negative D in the Q expansion of F. So remember that this D is the same as the D before, which was negative. So I'm really talking about um, coefficients of Q to the positive number. And once you have this modular form, I am going to show you the table again. And this is the same table as before, except I have inserted values of this modular form, uh, values of coefficients of this modular form in there. And you might notice that a bunch of these values are in red. So I'm going to ask you if you can guess what's common between all of those red numbers. There's a zero in the right hand column. There's a very good. That is a very good observation. Anything else? So what's common between these red numbers? Okay, so this is a trick question, right? I'm, I'm doing this on purpose. Um, here's an easier way of looking at this. Let's look at C of D mod 19. Well, now it's easier to notice that these are the numbers that are not zero mod 19. And, and, um, so it, it, uh, and as Robert pointed out, there's a zero in the right-hand column. So this is gonna be the content of the theorem I'm gonna state now. Um, if C of D is not zero mod 19, then the rank of AD is zero. Okay, so um, that's the, the main idea that suggests, but to rigorously define this theorem, I'm, I'm gonna have to um, introduce you to another object. So let TH denote Thompson's group. It's these, this sporadic simple group of order this. Um, notice the sporadic simple groups are, are actually completely determined by their order. So this is a very impractical definition, but it is a definition. Um, and if, if I let TH denote that, then we have the following theorem. The theorem says, and this is gonna be a handful, but we'll, we'll go through it slowly. There exists an infinite dimensional graded Thomson module, W, such that if the dimension of WD is non-zero mod 19, then the Morzel wave group is finite for each of the curve E of conductor 19 and each negative D as before. So a couple things here. What's happening? So this theorem is really two different theorems in one. Um, yeah, so, so in the paper that this talk is based on, which by the way, I'm gonna write down somewhere what that is. So no. That isn't working. Yeah. So it's on the archive now. And that's the archive number. And the paper that this the talk is based on, this theorem is actually two theorems, um, different ones. And that makes sense because this is doing two different things. So first, I we're saying that there is an infinite dimensional graded Thompson module whose graded dimension is f of tau. So c of d, as defined before, is dimension of wd, right? And in the actual paper, it's actually more complicated than that. And in the actual paper, we classify or characterize all Thomson modules whose graded dimension is, is f of tau. But I wanted, for the talk, I wanted this to be simpler. Um, and then the second part of the theorem is that if you have um, such a module, then you can connect um, the dimension to the model way group of, of these uh, electric curves. Okay, so we're gonna go through and, and talk about the, the sketch of the, a sketch of the proof of this theorem. Uh, but first, I also want to point out that, that the first part of this theorem, the part that said there is an infinite dimensional graded Thompson module is actually uh, an example of moonshine for the Thompson group. I haven't told you what moonshine is yet, but I'm gonna know. So I think this is a good time for me to tell you what my plan for this talk is. Um, so the first part of this talk was just giving you some motivation of, okay, stating this theorem makes sense. Uh, the second part is gonna be, I'm gonna tell you about some history of moonshine if you have never heard of it before this part is for you. Um, the, and then in the third part of the talk, I'm going to sketch the proof of theorem two. And as is a theme, it's going to be in two separate parts. Uh, we're going to talk about the existence module, and then we're going to talk about electric curves. 
Um, so any questions, concerns, or objections at this point before I delve into the history of Moon China a little bit? Okay, so let's talk about moonshine. So uh, the story starts basically at the classification of finite simple groups. Uh, arguably, it's the greatest achievements of 20th century math mathematics. It took like about 100 years and um, mathematicians working all around the world. Um, and, and doing this, they figured out that all of finite simple groups, almost all of finite simple groups, fit very neatly into three infinite families. So the cyclic groups, the alternative groups, and finite groups of link type. Um, except there are 26 exceptions to this rule. 26 groups don't fit in any of these three families. They are called the sporadic simple groups. And these are the ones that we are most interested in. In particular, we're interested in uh, the largest one of these. The largest of the sporadic simple groups is called the monster group, very appropriately named. Its uh, order of its elements is this huge number. This is eight times 10 to the 53 in scientific notation. And um, yeah, it's big is the point. Um, Fisher and Grice first conjectured that this such a group existed in 1973, and we got a first construction in 1981. So it took eight years. This is like 1970s and computing powers are not the same as they are in, in 2020. This is a really big group. It's hard to wrap your head around. Um, so it took eight years for us to have a first construction. In the meantime though, Conway and Norton had conjectured that the smallest non-trivial a monster irreducible representation is 196 3 dimensional. And Fisher, Livingstone, and Thorne um, had computed a, a character table for the monster group using this information. So uh, representation theory is, is one way of like simplifying hard problems in algebra and trying to um, make them into relatively easier problems in number theory, uh, not number theory, in linear algebra, right? So uh, in, into you, representation theory is basically looking at an object and then thinking, oh, if this was a matrix, you know, what what happens there? Um, so I want us to focus on the number 19683. 19683 is still a pretty large number. It's much smaller than 8 times 10 to the 53, but it is a pretty large number and it's in particular large enough that if this number appeared two times in different contexts, you might wonder, huh, I wonder if those two contexts are related. I wonder if those two instances have something in common. Well, that is what happened to John Mackay. He, saw, he noticed that 19683 is just one away from being a, a coefficient in the Q series of the normalized vector modular invariant. And this is the last time I'm going to call it that from being the coefficient of the J function is what we're going to say from now on. So um, he noticed that 1 plus 19683 is just 19684. And um, he told this to John Thompson, who said, actually, this happens more often. Um, if we start looking at more dimensions of the monster irreducible representations and we start adding them up, we start getting more coefficients of the J function. Okay, pretty weird, right? Well, in fact, it gets weirder. Uh, if you, so, so dimensions of irreducible representations of the monster group are basically entries in the first column of the character table. If you know anything about character tables, right? So the first, the first column is just traces of the identity, and that's the dimensions of irreducible representation. The, the second column is the trace of some other element, an element of order two, for example. So let's look at the second column instead and just add stuff in the same manner as before and get some numbers. Are these related to something? Well, yes, they are also coefficients of a modular form. Um, and this happens actually for every single one of the columns. And this observation um, led Thompson to conjecture um, the, following, the following conjecture, which now is a theorem. So there exists an infinite dimensional module for the monster group V, whose greater dimension is J of tau, the J function as before, and whose 
uh, Mackay Thompson series, or whose graded traces we now call the Mackay Thompson series. I don't think Thompson called them that. Um, TGF tau are all normalized principal moduli for genus zero subgroups of SL2R. Uh, this conjecture was proven by Borchardt's uh, building run work by Colin Norton and Franco Pasky Merman and probably other people that I'm forgetting to credit in 1922. Um, and the Part that I want us to focus on is that all of these functions turn out to be normalized principal moduli or genus zero subgroups of SL2R. Um, if you don't know what that is, that all you need to know, all you need to notice is that that's a rare thing, right? That's that's a very special function, um, and and the fact that all of them are of this type is weird. Um, the other thing about them is that a normalized principal modulus is actually uniquely determined by its invariance. So if for the monster group, for each element of the monster group, I give you um, the invariance group gamma G, right? So for each G, I give you the subgroup gamma G. Then I have basically given you the function and if I've given you the function, the function is just a graded trace. So I've given you all traces of G on the end for every single element of, of the monster group. And, and, and you basically have computed um, the structure of V as a, as a monster module without doing any computations with the monster itself. Um, so again, the story is very cool. Uh, but the point is, um, this is the story of Moonshine, and I want to draw a little bit of a parallel here um, with this theorem that we've uh, stated before. Um, I think it's nice to notice that this also does something similar in the following way, that you can say stuff about all of these elliptic curves without knowing things about these elliptic curves. All you have to do is look at this particular modular form and see if its coefficients are zero or not zero and one. 19, basically, right? Um, okay, so I think that's everything I want to say about Moonshine. And if there are any questions or concerns, we can pause here or we can jump into the sketch of the proof of the theorem. Okay, uh, okay, so, so let's jump into proof of theorem two. The proof of theorem two consists of two parts, as I said before. The first part is that we'll prove that there exists an infinite dimensional graded Thompson module W, such that the graded trace for each G is a reasonable method modular form in the following space. So it's a weight three halves uh, reasonable method modular form that transforms under gamma naught four times order of G uh, with a specific character dictated by G and it lies in the Conan plus space. And it has a specific behavior at the cusps. And um, I didn't want to write down the behavior because it's kind of a lot to write down, but I can tell you verbally what it is. Um, I wanted to have a pull at the cusp infinity of order five, right, which is just given by this um, six to the negative five. And I want it to be holomorphic at all other cusps, except uh, the, projecting something to the cusp, to the plus space um, introduces an extra pole sometimes. It introduce, introduces an extra pole at the cusp one over two times order of t. Um, and we're going to let that happen. We're going to allow that pole, except for that pole and the pole at infinity, we want it to be homomorphic at all, all cusps. Um, also, a thing to notice about being a specific behavior at the cusp is that this is the part that makes it analogous to, that, that makes it an example of, of um, Moonshine for the Thompson group. Okay, so given all of this, so, so if, if we uh, end up being able to prove, and sorry, uh, I am having a slight technical difficulty. Let's see. Nope, it's not going to work. We're, we're going to uh, deal deal with it without it. Okay, so if if I have the first part of the proof, right, then um, I, I want to be able to connect this to elliptic curves. And we'll talk about this later in, in a minute, but um, the thing that I want you to remember is that if I pick a, a 
an element G of order 19. So G in 19A means it's uh, 19A is the conjugacy class uh, of elements of order 19. Um, then by the fact that this is a Thomson module and G has order 19, the, the F19A needs to equal F1A, right? And I was planning on writing this down, but my iPad is not connecting. So we'll just we'll just um, say this slowly and hope that people know what I'm saying. So F subscript 1A needs to equal F subscript 19A, just by the fact that this is a uh, uh, this is the this is a Thomson module uh, mod 19. Sorry, needs to be equal to mod 19, right? And F subscript 19A is just the trace of G on on V N. F subscript 1a is just the trace of the identity on Wn, which is the dimension of Wd. Okay, so in the actual theorem, uh, the, uh, the congruence was that the dimension of Wd is non-zero, right, uh, mod, is non-zero mod 19. That uh, now, if we, if we, if we believe this uh, equation, will give us that the trace of G on, 90, on Vn is also non-zero mod 19. And this is the part that we're gonna connect to elliptic curves. Um, and that, just by the fact that this is a, an element of order 19, that might convince you a little bit more that I'm not lying to you, but we will come back to this part. So let's focus on part one for now. Um, how, how do I prove part one? I'm going to start by defining for each rational conjugacy class G, not in uh, 21A or 30B, I'm going to define um, FG with three homomorphic to be six times the Radomacher sum of weight three half level four times order of G that transforms with the same character psi of G um, of index minus five and projected into the plus phase. And that's a mouthful. And if you don't know what Rademacher sums are, I'm going to give you both a definition um, and a like 15 second spiel of what, what they are. So the definition first. Um, so the definition of this Rademacher sum is that it's this limit as k goes to infinity over some cosets. Um, that still seems like something that it might take a second for you to absorb. Uh, but my spiel for this is the following. If you have um, an element, let's say sigma, acting on a function f, right? And sigma, let's say sigma has um, order three. So sigma cubed is one. And you wanted a function that was invariant under sigma. One way of, of figuring out a function is to look at f plus sigma f plus sigma squared f. So again, I can't write this down anymore um, on my system, but write this down for yourself. So f plus sigma f plus sigma squared f is gonna be invariant under sigma, whatever f you start with, right? Because when you apply sigma to it, you'll just get sigma f plus sigma squared f plus sigma cubed f, which is f again. Okay, so so that's the main idea of Rademacher sums. You start with something, um, q to the negative five, and you act on it with this gamma, um, and then you sum over all of the gammas that are there, except this time, instead of sigma having order three, your group is infinite. So you might have an infinite order, so convergence is an issue. So you, you deal with that using limits. And that's not super rigorous, but that's hopefully that makes this slightly more digestible. Okay, so again, any questions or worries? At this point, what what why can't you choose G in these certain conjugacy classes? Why can't I choose G in these certain conjugacy classes? You, oh, these uh, yes, good. Um, so so you can uh so F I uh, you can define F G with your homomorphic tau. Also in in this space, the Rademacher sums. I wanted um Rademacher sums to be um to have integer questions and they didn't have um, a fast enough convergence for me to, to see. So it's just because convenience is my answer. Um, okay, good question. Any other questions or concerns? Is there a reason it's named after Rademacher? Did, did Hans Rademacher do work with this? Great question. 
I want to say yes. Um, he he started, I think, uh, for like weight zero, like writing the J function as the as the Radhamakar sum of weight zero and blah, 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 is, is Radhamakar's actual contribution to this. Thank you. Yeah, I, if anyone else knows more about that, they can feel free to interrupt and tell us. Well, I guess there's Rademacher. I mean, of course, the first is with the extension of the refinement of the hardy romanogen asymptotic, mm -hmm. hardy romanogen divergent series. Um, but there's also a paper by Rademacher and Zuckerman, um, which does any non-positive weight, I think. Oh. I think okay. it's about something like modular forms or automorphic forms of um, positive dimension, right? It's an old paper, so dimensions minus the weight, but yeah. This is connected directly to the circle method. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, right. It, it first came out of the circle method, although now in retrospect, we could say we could construct this stuff, direct, these things directly um, without using the circle method um, and, and see the modularity and, and build everything we would need. But um, yeah, that was how Rademacher first approached things. He, he looked at hardy hardy Ramanujan circle method. He noticed you could make a better choice of contours and then you would get these kind of series and then you would get convergent infinite series. Okay, so these are connected to the forward circle partition type contour. It's just, it looks exactly. a lot more abstract than I'm used to see. Yeah, exactly. But once you once you see this, you can like just see, as Miriam was saying, it's just a general idea of averaging over a group to get something that's invariant under some action, and then you could do it without you can do it without the circle method then in these applications. Yes, very good. Anyone else? Okay, um, great. So we've defined Rademacher's, uh, we've defined FG Luki homomorphic for each for each of these uh, conjugates process. And for Rademacher sums, like I said, convergence is usually a concern. Uh, but in this particular case, for a Rademacher sum of weight three halves and index minus five, um, John Duncan and Miranda Chang prove in their paper that um, it, it converges for these for this particular case, so we don't have to worry about that so much. Rademacher sums also are a tool for uh, computing bases of spaces of mock modular forms, right? So if they converge, they form, uh, they, they define mock modular forms of a certain weight and level. Um, and in this particular case, these ones um, actually turn out to have vanishing shadow, which means that they actually turn out to be weakly holomorphic. Um, and Hence the hence the suggestive weakly homomorphic. I define them to to say that, um, and that fact is also not hard to prove. Um, you just look at the spaces that shadows are allowed to be in, and it turns out that all for all of these, those spaces are just empty. Um, so it just has vanishing shadow by default. Um, and I'm gonna say this slightly awkwardly. This is written slightly awkwardly, but the following is true. If FG of tau exists, so this curly FG is from before, and the um, it's the trace of if the is the trace of the thing, and we're trying to prove that this thing exists, right? Um, if it existed, then it, this and its difference uh, from FG with you homomorphic would have to lie in this cusp one space. Now, why is this true? It's true because I told you that FG of tau has a very specific behavior at cusp uh, at poles. No, at cusps, sorry, uh, at cusps. It, it has a very specific polar behavior at, at cusps. So really you can't add um, anything that will screw with that behavior, right? So, so F G weakly homomorphic satisfies all the properties and it would be a good candidate for curly F G if um, up to an addition of cusp ones, basically. And so you might wonder, what, which, if any, cusp forms in this space are allowed for uh, for F G of tau to be a uh, uh, graded trace for a virtual module for the Thompson group? Okay, so for this, we need the criteria for existence of a module. Uh, it, w is a Thompson module if and only if there exist these numbers m1, m2, m3 integers such that the trace of G on WN 
is a linear combination of the of the irreducible rational characters of Thompson. So this basically is it again it looks like a lot of notation, but this is Mashke's term from like basic representation theory, right? Which says that if you have um, a v, which is a representation of, of your group G, then v has to be uh, decomposable into irreducible representations of that group G. So that's that's basically the idea here. That's that's what's going on. Um, so in order for something to be a rational character, a virtual rational character, you need it to be um, a linear combination of the irreducible ones. Okay. So the cusp forms that work are ones that make these multiplicities integral. Um, now this feels slightly like a throwaway comment of like, oh yeah, just pick the ones that work. But the fact that there are any that work is a big deal, right? That's the that's the that's the actual content of the theorem that like, okay, this this there there is one, there there, there exists some cusp forms that actually work. Um, okay, so that's all of the details I'm gonna give about the first part of the theorem because I wanna move on to the part that connects to elliptic curves, which is the part that I started this talk with. So again, any worries until this point? I'm gonna pause because now I'm going to move on to the other part of the theorem. Great, thank you. Okay, so from the proof of the first part, we're gonna get the following. And again, this is a lot of um, notation, but let's break it down. This part, six times the Radhamakar sum, is just f weekly homomorphic G of tau, right? And then I, I said maybe a cusp form works, and the the one that works um, is just is is the one that I've written down here. It's the unique um, cusp form in S three halves plus Demonot seventy six, which starts with equation eighteen. Basically. Um, notice that S3 house plus gamma dot 76 has dimension one. So there was only one option except up to a constant and the constant came out of the proof, the proof that we did before. Um, okay, so so I have that F19A is is six times this Radhamaker sum plus 18 times this cusp form and I'm gonna write it as, as it's, um, as, as coefficients are in, in a Fourier transform. So and I say six Rn, where Rn is coefficients of the Radhamaker sum, suggestively named. And B19A is going to be coefficients of my cusp form. Okay. And if I have all of these things, then I get the following. Remember, F1A is equal to F19A. This is the stuff I wanted to write before, but now I can. F1A is equal to F19A mod 19 just by the fact that this is a Thomson module. And F1A is trace, its, its coefficients are trace of the identity of Wn, which is the dimension of Wn. And F19A has these coefficients, 6Rn plus 18 times B19AM. And so I get that dimension of Wn is equivalent to 6 times Rn plus 18 times B19AM one nineteen. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, my next goal is to look at these two coefficients on the right hand side separately. So first, I'm going to prove that 6Rn in the cases that I care about for n equals d as before, just goes to zero. And I'm, then I'm going to show that B19A is actually related to elliptic curves of um, conductor 19. Okay, so let's do the first part first. So for G in 19 A as, as above and D as above, so D is a negative fundamental discriminant and it's not, not a square modulo 19. I'm gonna show that R of D is zero and my code and code proof is the following. Since it's a, it's a coefficient of a rather longer sum by like a corollary of Miller and Pixton's work, you can just write it as a sum over some quadratic forms. So you can write it as a trace of a singular modulus, but like if you don't know what that means, if all of this notation is scary to you, that's fine. The only thing that I want you to concentrate on is this particular um, thing in red here. So uh, Rn is the sum over 
quadratic forms of um, positive definite quadratic forms of discriminant 5n, discriminant uh, minus 5n, such that 4 times 19 times some other number, right? So b squared minus 4 because n because 19 divides a. Um, and I'm just going to go right ahead and look at this equation mod 19. So I will get that minus 5n is b squared mod 19. And I'm going to do the same thing again. And I'm going to ask you, why do you think this equation has no solutions in the particular case that we care about, where n is absolute value of d? So I claim this equation has no solutions. And remember, d is negative. So absolute value of d is negative d. So this whole thing is just 5d. Right? And I'm saying 5d is not a quadratic residue mod 19. 5 is 81. Is that, is that the right number? 5, 5 is. Anyway, 5 is. And D isn't. That was the condition that we talked about way earlier in this talk. So in particular, for N equals absolute value of D, 5D mod 9, 5D is not a quadratic residue mod 19. So this set is empty. So the sum is empty. And so our D is just zero. Great. Happy with that? Okay. So now we've gotten rid of RD and we just have dimension of WD is equal to 18 times B 19 A D mod 19. That is, if we look at, so the stuff that's in red is, is in red because this is the stuff that's part of the statement of the theorem. So if the congruence in the statement of the theorem is correct, then 19 cannot divide B 19 A D. So my next step is gonna be proving that this is the same as saying that 19 does not divide the ELF function of um, elliptic curves um, ED, where E is an elliptic curve of order 19. Okay, so this is, I'm just throwing that out there that this is so, but believe me for a second. If you believe this statement, then notice the following. If 19 doesn't divide a number, then that number cannot be zero, right? So 19, so LED is non zero minus 19 in particular means that it's zero, it's not zero. And now I'm going to ask you to like go back. If you took any notes, then I told you one fact to remember for the end of this talk, which was that if L, the L function is non-zero, then the rank is zero. So in particular, if 19 doesn't divide the L function, then the L function is non-zero. And that implies that the rank is zero. So we would be done if I prove if I prove that 19 not dividing this cusp form coefficient is the same as 19 not dividing the L function. Okay, so let's delve into that. That requires a sort of a big hammer, but we'll work through it together. So by the modularity theorem, um, each elliptic curve is modular. So for every elliptic curve of conductor 19, there is a unique weight to a new form of level 19 such that the L function of the elliptic curve is equal to the L function of this uh, new form, right? And for, uh, we're gonna denote by GE of tau, the weight three halves cusp form that is associated to this new form under the Shintani lift. Then this lemma, which was first, uh, I think, uh, this first appeared in Duncan Merton's and uh, so uh, John Michael and Ken's paper on N Munchen and arithmetic. I think that's what it's called. Um, but it's based on, and, and it's not one, it's not written in this way in the paper, right? I made these into 19s. It's about a general P. Um, and two, it's based on work by like a bunch of people. So Conan's uh, work in particular and Nagash's work, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, um, but it says basically this, and I didn't include a proof in my main slides of this lemma, 
but I can say some more things about it if we have time at the end. So if anyone asks, I can I can say further things about it. I don't know why there's a space here that's bothering me. Anyway, um, the point is, this lemma says the following. The order of vanishing mod 19, right? So in, uh, whether 19 divides this quantity or not, um, is depends on whether 19 divides this quantity or not, or d equals d naught for some, some d naught, and the cusp form coefficient b e t squared. b e is the same as this question um, of g e t equals b e, right? And d naught equals zero is the smallest possible d, and you can just pick the smallest possible d is, is minus four, and you can compute what this side is, and this side turns out to be zero just by computing this through magma. And so you get that um, order 19 LED over omega ED. By the way, omega ED is the real period of ED. Um, and it's some invariant of an elliptic curve. Don't ask me a lot about it. I don't know a lot about it. I just know that it's some invariant of the elliptic curve doesn't affect the valuation. Um, uh, um, the mod 19 violation. So now we have that order 19 of LE is equal to order 19 of BED squared. In particular, if this side was zero, then this side would be zero. That is, if 19 didn't divide, if 19 didn't divide this cusp form question, then it wouldn't divide this, this, uh, this whole thing either. And in particular, it wouldn't divide the L function. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So B D is the Q to the T quotient of G E, which lies in the space that I made red. Um, and I made it red because it appeared earlier somewhere. And I'm going to go back a few slides to show you where it appeared. So remember here, we said F19A is the Rademacher sum plus 18 times this cusp form where this cusp form is the unique normless cusp form in S3 halves plus gamma naught 76. This is the same space as this space. And we also said that this space has dimension one. So if there are two normalized things in, in this space, they have to be the same thing, right? So since this is a one dimensional space, B D is just equal to B 19 A D. Again, suggested notation because of that, right? So I'm calling them both B blah because of that. Um, okay, so in particular, I've shown that if 19 doesn't divide this coefficient, then 19 doesn't divide B E D squared. And that means this side is zero. So 19 doesn't divide the L function. If 19 doesn't divide the L function, then the L function cannot be zero. And so um, the rank is zero from the fact that I gave you a long time ago. Okay, this was a lot of this happened and then this happened and this happened. So I'm gonna give you a quick summary, slightly visual summary of this. So we started with an elliptic curve of conductor 19. I said that the modularity theorem connects it to the weight, uh, to a weight two near form, a unique weight two near form GE. Um, and again, this should say E and not curly E, but things you find out. Um, and then that connect, is connected via the Shantani lift to um, with three half cusp forms, little g. And lemma four basically gives you that this elliptic curve's out function is connected to this cusp form. Um, and because this cusp form lies in the same one dimensional subspace as the cusp form that appeared in our, in the proof of the first part of that theorem, they, ha they have to be equal. They're both normalized, they lie in the same one dimensional cusp, cusp Um, So we're done. Any, I'm gonna leave the picture of the theorem up here and I'm gonna pause to ask if there are any questions or concerns about that proof. Ian. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, so I guess, can you explain why 19 is special in this case? Like you need to tie to the Thompson group, I guess, right? You need a group with order 19. Is it really just that you end up in a one dimensional space when you go through the modular forms? Or is there something more special with like 19 in the Thompson group that makes this all work? This is an excellent question. 
So um, I, at the end, of, so let, let me jump. So I'm going to stay the term for 14 or 7, I guess. Power, okay, I don't look at this more uh, very closely. I will come back to this and I will say it. Um, so no, there isn't anything super special about the about 19, except it's a prime that divides the Thompson into two. Um, and things work out for it. Um, uh, maybe can I ask like the opposite question then? Like if you pick another random group that has elements of order 19, like what's special about the Thompson group? Oh, that's also a good question. Um, so uh, the Onan Munchen paper, I think, does something very similar with, uh, I want to say also 19, um, that that 19 divides on the group, and they do it with like 11, and maybe another prime, maybe 17, I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a good point. And I don't think that the Thompson group is special in, in this story in that way. Yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna say, but like, don't quote me on it. Yeah, um, anyway, other, other questions or thoughts? That's so long. Okay, I have a thought. So what I've just done is I've told you, so summary of my story very quick. My, my story was basically, hey, computing ranks is hard. Here's a theorem where all you have to do is look at these coefficients of the sum, sum was reform. And um, that will give you some information about these ranks. Now, it, it turned out that the coefficients that I'm talking about were also hard to compute, then I've basically done nothing, right? So I want to convince you that these are not hard to compute at all. Um, here, I, I, I just want to give you a formula for them. So each CD or dimension of WD is just given by this finite sum over uh, values of the J function uh, of quadratic forms uh, of discriminant 5D. So it's not actually hard to prove. And now, oh, I had to compute. And now to answer Ian's question one more time, uh, 19 is not super special. There's actually more, more and, uh, that the Thompson group can give us. Um, I'm going to consider a negative fundamental discriminant, for which now I want the Kronecker symbol um, for 7 to be minus 1. So I, I want it to be not a quadratic residue mod 7. And D2 to be 1, which does not mean that it's odd or something. It, it means something about, I think it means that D has to be plus or minus one mod eight. And I'm gonna let E be, be an electric curve conductor 14, so seven times two, right? And I'm gonna let G be an element of order 14 in the Thomson group. Then I have a similar statement. So if the trace of G on WD is non-zero mod 49 this time, so seven squared, then the Mordelway group is finite. And the seven part of the tate Shafarevich group is trivial. Um, that's more complicated and didn't have time to get into that, but this is something you can prove about 14. Also, about 14, you can say more things. Um, if the trace is non-zero mod 49, so the same trace, and you have this other condition that the trace on W4, so the Q to the 4 question, is not 43 mod 56. Then the summer group, the seven summer group is non-trivial. And if the L function is non-zero, then also the Tate-Chaparovich group is, is, um, is zero, is non-zero, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so there are other things you can prove. And for proof and details, look at the paper. Um, and that's it. That's all I wanted to say. That took, I think, 50 minutes. Any questions or worries? Or thoughts. I think I think first let's like virtually clap for Miriam. Thanks Thank for you. Great um, yeah. Now, so now does does anyone have any uh, comments or questions? I guess I I have more. Oh, is Rob? Yeah. Well, Ian, you can go ahead. I, mine's more because I don't know very much about these. Uh, 
the, the modules that come from like the, the moonshine side. So like in practice, how would, how do you compute these dimensions um, of things? Like, is it, is now that we have moonshine is like the standard way to actually compute these coefficients of modular forms? Or is there actually like a straightforward way to say, hey, I can compute a dimension over here and that tells me something about a rank of an elliptic curve? Um, so if I'm understanding your question correctly, how do you compute the C of D? Is well, no, the, the C of D, I get that comes from modular form. I'm asking, I guess, like, if, is computing the dimension of W sub D is the best way to do that to compute C of D? Or is there something purely on like the, the these infinite dimensional graded module side that, that makes it easy to compute? So I will say that. Because hmm. right there was, yeah. The reason I, this, and this might be a dumb question because I, I, I don't no, know. No, you're fine. Yeah. But like, if you could choose like any group with elements of order 19, right? Like choose the cyclic group of order 19 and maybe these dimensions are really easy to compute. And then maybe that's like a, like that's definitely too good to be true. Like there's something's got to break down over there. You can't Yeah. Just, so, so the thing I can show you the thing that breaks down, I guess. Um, so here. I said that this I, I said this part as like a throwaway remark, but but the fact that there is a Thompson module is the point, right? So not every dimension will work uh, and give you the same uh, a moonshine module, and not every uh, yeah not every greater dimension will work and give you a, a moonshine. Got module. it. So, so that is where there is really something special about yeah. the Thompson group. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Other questions or thoughts? Robert. For one thing, Miriam, that was a, an amazing talk. Thank you very much. It was so interesting. Um, thank you, Robert. Th uh, thank you. Are there, mo more generally, is this phenomenon of Q series coefficients matching up with um, enumerating subgroups or other substructures of other algebraic structures? Is, does this appear in other places? That is, coefficients of Q-series tied to other types of structures in algebra? Other groups, other, uh, or, or perhaps other fields or rings or other things? Again, that's an excellent question. Um, for groups, yes, like the whole story of Moonshine is this, that, yes. that uh, I, I told you about Monsters Moonshine, but there's like Umbro Moonshine and Matthew Moonshine and other names that, Onan Moonshine, like st names that I'm forgetting. Um, for other algebraic structures, that's a, that's a good question, and I don't know of an example. Like, because because representation theory of other algebraic structures is a real thing, um, so I don't know if like there's there's stuff out there that's already done. People have already done something uh, with with that, but that that's interesting to think about for sure. That's uh, really really interesting. Thank you. Like. I mean, Robert, just, a, I mean, it's still essentially moonshine, but like the McDonald identities are pretty much are uh, a refinement sort of of moonshine for the Lie algebras, right? Where you oh, get yeah. some other variables yeah. in there. I see. That's I see. a very good, good example. It's really fascinating. Thank you. It it's probably too story. much to, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably too much to hope for, but. Would there be any chance that you could understand the statistics of the divisibility by 19 on the, on the moonshine side? Ooh. You know, we expect it to be rank zero or not zero in these twists half the time. Um, is there any natural reason to expect 50% of the time you'd have this divisibility in the, in the Thompson side? That's an, again, an excellent question. I'm really glad we're recording this because I will come back and look at these. Um, I haven't thought about that. And I will say that this theorem works, um, it, it's not an if and only if, right? So I said, here, let me go back all, all the way. I said, oh, look, if these are, if these are non-zero, then these are zero. So it's not an if and only if, so I don't immediately see how, but never say no. And that sounds really interesting. I feel like that's something I, I want to look at. Is, do, do the merits suggest that if, that it is an if and only if? Um, well, 
there's something something or, can go to the Selmer group too. Sorry, say that again. Well, it wouldn't be right because something can go into the Selmer group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, the numeric suggests that you like a more complicated statement than this. That like, um, okay, let me figure out how to, you either have the rank of zero or the Selmer group does something. So, so you can you can state something like that, but to prove it, you would need um, BSD. Like it would be conditional upon BSD. But still, it implies that there there should be some kind of statistics. Yeah. Of how often dimensions should be divisible by nineteen, which just from an algebra point of view seems kind of strange. Yeah, I think that's that's. And then that, that's a very, very interesting point that I haven't thought of before, but yeah, that seems like it might work. Can, uh, I, can I perhaps uh, connect to one question that Ian, uh, the question that Ian asked? Um, mm -hmm. If you have these characters, and so uh, it's basically to probe how special the Thompson group is, this question. So in principle, I can write down some vector valid model form with these characters. Um, and perhaps I'm lucky and I get a uh, modular form that has only positive coefficients and integral and so on. And then I can, of course, revert that. And I would, in principle, get hypothetical uh, coefficients for the conjugacy classes of such a monster module, except that I have started with the modular form and the representation, so I don't have the group for that. Is there a way to, with this data, reverse that construction? Basically, it's kind of a modular data go to a group thing. So what you're saying is, um, let me let me figure out it, parse that question a little bit. So start with a modular form, look at its like siblings and and all of these levels. Well, mm -hmm. and then and then question uh, ask whether there's a there's a group out there that has these characters. Yeah, I mean uh, yeah. More or less, exactly. I mean, what is the the shape of all these representations that they are twisted permutation representations, so twisted by the uh, roots of unity that come out mm -hmm. of the code cycle for the group. And then yeah. you do the free transform that gives you the character basis. Yeah, so yeah, those yeah. you demand for the modular forms with positivity and integrality conditions. But in principle, at this point, you don't need the uh, group, you can just start with some twisted permutation representation, yeah. then ask once you find such a modular form for the Fourier transform or a partial Fourier transform, has there been a group that actually implements this? Yeah, that's, I don't Because once you can answer this. such a question, so. Yeah, so go ahead. Sorry. So once you can answer that a question, I think you have a much more precise answer to the question how special the Thompson group is. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I can't think of a reason why that would break. Um, but I don't think I have anything smart to say about that. Any other questions for Miriam? Uh, can you go back to the, uh, the slide where you uh, specifically mentioned uh, the um, uh, the actual statement of moonshine, in particular the role that the genus of the corresponding group plays? This. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm sorry, I've never studied moonshine, so I don't know much about it. I just I'm glad there are some people, at least in the audience, who have not seen this story before because it's such a fun story to tell. And I'm really honored that I'm one of the first people to tell you this story. <laughs> Oh, thank you. The pleasure is mine.
Okay, so I have no specific question. I was just curious about it. That is fine. That works. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Robert. Okay. Um, so it looks like from your talk that in order to understand moonshine, one kind of has to know about a lot of different topics. And it seems kind of interesting in that way because it seems it's like one of those uh, topics in number theory or in mathematics that like touches almost everything else, kind of like partition theory or other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, is like if one were going to get into moonshine, Miriam, could you give a quick list of the types of topics that one would want <laughs> to start to look into? <laughs> like I see representation theory here. Um, of course, we have finite groups. Um, are there a few other major topics that one would want to have modular mastery forms. of? Forms. I think I think you should know stuff about modular forms. Obviously, and so uh, this is a really fun question because when I first started grad school, the first thing that my advisor John Duncan made me do was read um, Borchardt's paper, this 1992 paper that that he proves this theorem in. Uh, that's on the slide right now. And Borchardt writes so well. He's like one of my favorite math writers. He like holds your hand and like walks you through things very slowly and it's so great. Um, and and so I have definitely, that, so this is something that I've thought about Robert a lot because um, it is one of my math goals in life to one day teach a course which, is, which does this, which like has like topics, all the things that you need to know to be able to read Borchardt's paper or like to be able to like read a paper in Moonshine and like know what, what there is. Anyway, to, to directly answer your question, I guess you need to know uh, things about modular forms and obviously things about representation theory. And if you want to get into the word itself or your algebra side of stuff, then you need to know stuff about the algebras. And then if you want to get into some applications and the number theory, you want to know something about elliptic curves. I kind of learned stuff about elliptic curves as like, what do I need for this? And then grab those pieces and start it there. Uh, but then over time, I've expanded that. So I don't know. I feel like if, if like a first year grad student came up to me and was like, what do I need to know? I would say like be able to grab a lot of things from, you know, different buckets and just take the things that you, you need and run with them. That's great advice. Thank you. And also I will totally sign up for your class. <laughs> One day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.